You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Some real estate investors say they will never sell their property. They say it's buy and hold for a reason. But what if the properties you own have doubled or tripled in value and the rents aren't anywhere close to the value of the property? In other words, would you buy the property today at the current price point and the rent that it brings in? For many people, the answer is no. And that means they may be sitting on a whole lot of dead equity. Today, we're going to talk about how you can bring that equity back to life through a 1031 exchange. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. And who better to join us today than an expert on 1031s, Jeff Bemis, who owns 1031 Specialists. Jeff worked for Ernst & Young as a CPA before turning his career toward finance and attaining his CFA designation. In 2006, Jeff joined Rimrock Capital Management a California-based hedge fund with $4 billion under management. He led the less liquid and alternative capital strategies at Rimrock during his 15 years as portfolio manager, which included billions of dollars of investment in commercial real estate. But Jeff left Rimrock and took all his experience with him to start his own 1031 exchange company in what he says is a tech-forward, education-first, customer-centric way to be different. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. Jeff, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell me a little bit about how you see investors being able to save a lot in taxes through the 1031 exchange. Uh, Yeah, no, it'd be my pleasure. Uh, You know, it's, you know, I work with a firm called 1031 Specialists. We help investors who are selling investment properties uh, defer taxes. You know, lots of folks these days have a lot of capital gains embedded in the properties that they own. And for various reasons, which we can talk about if you like, uh, are deciding to make a change. They want to swap into uh, something different or a different type of piece of real estate or geography or otherwise. And all those embedded gains, depreciation recapture, you know, amongst other taxes, state taxes uh, can all be deferred through a 1031 exchange. So we help facilitate that on behalf of clients. So I I know a lot of our listeners already know about 1031 exchanges, but for anyone who's new to this, it's it's actually the way that I got started in real estate was through a 1031. So it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, But there are a lot of people don't realize that you can sell a property that's doubled or tripled in value. And as long as you buy other property within 40, you identify within 45 days and close within 180, right? Correct. Correct. You got it right. Um, then it just kind of counts as the same property in the eyes of the IRS. So um, you're, you're just deferring that. But what happens if you just keep deferring, but then someday you pass away? Well, that's, you know, I don't know if it's the beauty because we're talking about when you pass away, but um, you know, one of the things that's that's a real opportunity inside of this is you defer taxes. Let's say you buy a property for half a million dollars in a hypothetical example, and it and it grows and grows through time, and it and you accumulate uh, you know various properties, probably build up your portfolio, and you have several million maybe by the time you uh, pass away. Um, you can uh, ultimately your heirs will step up their basis through um, when they inherit the properties and you know, you'll never pay a dime in tax on any of that embedded gain. So it ends up being this, we sort of use the coin of the terms, you swap till you drop. And then ultimately it sets up your family uh, for a foundation for their own success and hopefully can continue on and, 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 and the like, you know, obviously there's a pretty large um, inheritance tax, um, you know, uh, exemption, meaning you can defer, you know, as a married couple up to, you know, roughly 26 million. So, you know, it would take a really large portfolio for to not have it step up for your kids and, and yeah, or, or whoever your heirs might be. So yeah, it's a really powerful tool. I mean, it's been around for a very long time and, and uh, many, many, many folks have used it to uh, build up a a great nest egg and um, a powerful uh, passive way to make money. Yeah. So again, if you, bought the property for 500,000 by the time you die 
Um, it's worth $2 million. That would be a $1.5 million gain that you would pay capital gains on. But your, if your kids inherit that property, then the property value is stepped up. Again, I'm just explaining to people. Yeah, who don't sorry, maybe know I should do this. it in more rudimentary. No, no, terms. no, it's and okay. My apology, Kathy. Yeah. No, I'm just. I just figure most of our experienced investors already know this, so I'm speaking right, to the right. new investor who may not realize that that step up means that once you pass away, the value of that property is now what market value is, which would be let's say two million, and so there is no gain. If your children decide to sell that property after you die, there's no tax because there's no gain. That property is now the basis of it is the 2 million instead of the 500,000. Correct. So it is, it is kind of incredible. And probably one of the reasons why uh, there's been so much pushback about the 1031 and threats to take it away. And like, this is not fair. So where are we now? I know um, currently the Biden administration has been talking about reworking the 1031. Is there any momentum there? No. And, and folks we talk to in the industry say we're probably in the best place we've been in quite a long time. I mean, it does come up. And you know, to be fair, so 1031 exchanges used to apply to uh, equipment, heavy equipment, and a bunch of other asset classes, airplanes, and other things. And a lot of that got removed in 2017. Um under Trump. And so uh, it got changed materially, the amount of things that fall under this. But as far as properties go, goes, it's been around for 100 years. The the folks I talk to who are actively in discussions, it certainly comes up. It's certainly a talking point. People like to talk about it just because people have accumulated so much wealth inside of it. But it's in a really comfortable place with people that I know that are far more connected than I am at. It would be a big, big surprise if anything like this changed. But you never know in Washington, so I won't I won't say definitively, and I, I don't know if that can be relied upon, but that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, you know, you never know if the tax law is going to change. So by the time we all pass away, it may not step up to market value. Yeah. We don't know, but that's currently how it is. So it's important to understand that if you have elderly parents or grandparents who want you to have their property, they should not give it to you before they die because you're basically taking on that tax, right? You you have to wait until after it should be in the trust that it comes to you. Then you get that step up and then you don't have to pay those taxes. I, certainly, there there are ways you can you can work with your CPA if if there were some particular reason. Just to let your listeners know, you could uh, facilitate and use some of your gift tax exemption in advance if you so wanted to. But absolutely, you know the you know taking advantage of the step up in basis to where you inherit the property at the then market value, and if you wanted to sell it or otherwise, you could do so without incurring any tax and take the full cash out. That's absolutely an opportunity. Um, you know, lots of folks are, um, you know, folks who've inherited things maybe a handful of years ago, just to sort of take a little step forward of people who are using 1031, you know, folks who had parents uh, pass away. And this has happened a lot in the last, I don't know, half a decade where the inheriting land or other legacy positions that the family have owned that have really gone up in value as, you know, really interesting new projects come to bear. And that would be an example of folks who are taking advantage, say they have land in the family that a developer can use. And, you know, the, hey, we'd love to get a yield on that and create a more of an income stream. You know, 1031, if you have new gain that that occurred since you inherited it, is a great way for you to defer all that tax and get, you know, effectively buy more property than you would be able to otherwise. So as an oh. example... Yeah, we have such a great story on that where one of our real wealth members inherited a, a property in San Francisco that was really in bad shape, in such bad shape, they weren't comfortable renting it. So they were just mm -hmm. sitting on it. But in the couple of years that they sat on it, it went up in value yeah. so much, but it was just sitting there vacant. Uh, she, the wife heard me on the radio. I was on KSFO at the time and thought, well, what do I have to lose? Uh, she ended up putting that mar that property on the market for 1.5 million, and that's what wow. she got for it. I think when she inherited it, it was around 800. So, yeah. you know, another big gain there. Um, but instead, we helped them 1031 into about 20 <clears throat> rental properties around the country, and within you know six months' time from the time that they put it on the market, and we helped them. That's kind of our strength at Real Wealth is. How do you find 20 properties? That's that's what we do. We can help you yeah. do that. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that, that example comes up a reasonable amount, you know, and especially yeah. as, as markets like Montana and Idaho and Utah and, 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 you know, areas that are more tertiary to sort of core 
locations that are um, that are going on. Folks have a lot of property out there that um, this is a great tool. They should at least be exploring, you know, as, a, yeah. as an opportunity for themselves, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in this case, they were retired in six months because of all the income just from that one exchange. That's incredible. I love that. Yeah. So there's arguments that, again, um, it, this only benefits wealthy people, but um, but on the flip side, the argument is actually it benefits renters. It, it, it benefits people who um, who would otherwise be sitting in dilapidated properties. So let's let's talk about that. Like in this particular sure. case, she sold the property that she didn't have the money to fix. Someone else bought that property in San Francisco and did have the money to fix it. So now right. that property's back on the market. But yeah, what's the argument for how? a 1031 exchange and this whole tax break that we get actually contributes to society? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Kathy, and I'm happy to take it on. But, you know, there's been some analysis as part of the reason the 1031, you know, the view is that it's not going to shift from the property side is it is facilitating a very large component of the of the economy. And what it's doing is it's facilitating folks to come into areas that they wouldn't otherwise come into. It's facilitating folks to liquidate property they might otherwise not liquidate. It's also generating a ton of job growth in and around those efforts. And then from a, I'll call it from a holistic perspective, it creates incentives for, for investors to, you know, be inside of property and, sort of build them up from an investment perspective. And so, you know, 1031s cater to long-term holds. This isn't for fix and flips. This isn't for develop a, a, a sort of a home builder whose business is building products, selling right away. This is for the investment community and it creates dollars just like, you know, you have economic development zones, you have all these like areas that we try and create some incentives. This really does create, create a framework for capital to go into what is such a core part of, you know, living standards in the United States. So, you know, taking a step back, it's absolutely supportive of all the things that I think a lot of us want to stand for in this country of like, how do we create living environments for folks and, and the like? And it definitely does that and creates um, a lot of economic economic activity in that that wouldn't otherwise exist. So let's talk about the rules of the 1031. Sure. <clears throat> let's again say you bought the $500,000 house in San Francisco. It's worth 2 million. Now you're not getting very much rent on it, or there's just issues yeah. around the area. You don't, you don't want to deal with, uh, what do you do? How does it work? Okay. Yeah, and let's sure. say you have a loan on it. Let's say that there's still a loan on that property. Right. And I mean, the rules, while it can be a little intimidating in truth, if you do some planning, just as a precursor to this, it's a very reasonable, comfortable process. And, and, and to the extent that there are pieces that you're uncomfortable with working with folks, you know, like you, Kathy, or others, um, who can, you know, help, help advise you on the ways to set yourself up for success. It really is, um, pretty, a pretty straightforward and I'm not going to say easy to execute, but, you know, very comfortable to execute your goals inside of. So, if you want to do a 1031 exchange, first thing, or you, know, you own property, let's say you have a million dollar properties because uh, keep the math easy and you have a $500,000 loan and $500,000 of equity in this property on a market value. <clears throat> and you have, uh, you know, you bought the property a few, you know, many years ago for a hundred thousand dollars. So you have $900,000 in gain. I mean, the, f the amount of gain that, you know, my mother, for example, has in some of her portfolio is, is, <laughs> is, is very large. You know, she's been a, California, you know, person her whole life and, you know, just the, the years and, and the, the economic sort of back, backbone yeah. of it. All so, you have to do is grow old to become rich in California. I, I mean, I, I <laughs> uh, maybe so, maybe so. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so um, with that scenario, you have a half a million dollars in debt, you have a million dollar property. First things first is to understand what are you trying to accomplish and go reach out to folks in and around that. So I let's say I have a million dollar property that's land because I think it's a it's a classic example that we see or it's a property like a single family rental that you manage yourself and you don't want to do that anymore. You want to go to where it's something maybe more professionally managed third party. That's also a very common example amongst others. So what you do is you reach out to 1031 specialists or anyone else who's a qualified intermediary. And then you'd also be dealing with a likely a 
real estate broker, right, on your team who's helping you think about marketing the property and any other advisors you might want to have um, in and around your transaction. Just, okay, how do I sell it for a great price? And then if your view is I want to own other property that, you know, say accomplishes more of a yield profile versus this land example, you'll want to be in advance thinking about how am I going to get this replacement property? Because it, in a 1031 exchange, that's true that we're doing. We're going to sell your my own property and we're going to buy another property or multiple properties. And so why are you reaching out to a, we are what's called a qualified intermediary. Why are you reaching out to a qualified intermediary is because the IRS requires it. If you want to accomplish a 1031 exchange, yeah. There's no you other can't, way. you can't touch the money. You cannot you can't touch the money. Yeah. It can't, if it goes in your bank account, you messed up. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. So what, what do we do as a qualified intermediary? We, we, we help advise clients in, in as far as giving them sort of, here's what to look out for. Here's the issue spotting. Here's what you should be doing to set yourself up for success. Here's what we're going to do. You know, we establish all the documentation that'll be required. You will engage a qualified intermediary. When you sell your property, the money from that property will go to the qualified intermediary subject to documentation that you set up. And the qualified intermediary will hold that money. Obviously, you'll want to investigate that your qualified intermediary is using best in class sort of practices on how they hold the money, how who has access, where does it go? Yeah, make sure they're mean? not investing it in Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we're doing quite the opposite. We're setting up a qualified escrow account in your name. You can look at it. You can understand that it's sitting there. We can't move it unless you authorize it. So like, you definitely should ask that question because it's not required to do it that way as, mm. a, as a quick note. Okay. Yeah. Ask where, where are you putting my money? Yeah. Where good are you question. Putting the money? And yeah. how do I know that it's safe? <laughs> and it's an important question. Um, and so we will hold the money and then you have, there's two main big timelines to that matter. Once you what's quote unquote transfer the property, which is generally your by and large is that closing of your first property. You now have a clock that starts um, again, this is all mandated by Title 26, Section 1031. That's why it's called this of the tax code. You sell, uh, you'll need to do two things. You'll have to complete this whole thing within 180 days, which is generally a pretty comfortable timeline. But the first deadline, so you sell your property, the money comes to the qualified intermediary. You will need to identify replacement properties within 45 days. And so... That is the first major step. It's an important step. It's a step that um, why we say planning is important. And so how we work with clients is we'll consult with our clients as far in advance as you'd like. And we're happy to do that. And, and we love it when clients are doing that because they're set up for success. And that's ultimately our goal is to see our clients accomplish what they're trying to do, which is defer taxes and get into what they want. Yeah. So in 45 days, you identify, generally people use identify three properties, but there's a couple other ways you can identify replacement properties as far as how many and to what value, but you'll need to buy replacement property of the same market value. And it could be multiple properties and you'll have to have the same amount of debt. If you don't do that, all are part of your transaction may be subject to, to tax effectively. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So if you do any of these things wrong, then you're paying the tax. So you don't right. put the then money you in your the own bank. The transaction. That's exactly yeah. Right. That's, that's like the worst thing that's going to happen. And, and maybe right, yeah. I'm guessing some penalties, but if no, you. No real penalties. It's, it's just, okay. they just disregard that you're doing a 1031, right? Okay. So it's just, you know, you're going to pay the piper. Okay. Okay. So yeah. uh, you need the qualified inter intermediary to take your, take the funds and hold them safely. You need to identify the properties you're going to exchange into that you're going to buy as replacement uh, right. within that 45 days. And then you have to close on those properties in 180 days. Um, right. So those are, those are the big things. But if you have a loan, you have to get the same amount of loan on like you have to, that transfers over. So if you had a $500,000 loan on that property, you have to be able to get another $500,000 loan on one of the properties or spread out among them. And Correct. people forget that you can get a larger loan, right? So you could, yes. you could finance all, all three of those <clears throat> um, to the, to the hilt, right. So to be able you to buy more. Invest your equity though, too. So you would have to yeah. buy, you can buy more property, right. To your point, you just need to 
um, be able to buy the, you have to buy at least the same amount, right? And you yeah. can bring new money to the transaction if you so desire. Everything goes in. So all the equity, the debt, but you can get more debt so you could buy more. Yes. Um, if you, if you want your equity back, then you need to consider, uh, you know, a. Uh, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, opportunity zone, opportunity zone. You can, you can get some of your equity back, but that's a whole different, a whole different discussion. Different yes, exactly. Yeah. Whole different discussion. Okay. So, um, what we've seen mistakes in the past, uh, real wealth investors calling us frantically is either they put their, you know, they identified properties, but then weren't able to close on those properties for whatever reason. Either they couldn't qualify for that loan that they needed to get. So keep that in mind. If you quit your job, you may not qualify for the loan that you qualified right. for, or the interest rate is higher and it just doesn't work. So just know that you better have all that lined up, right? Sure. Um, yeah. We, we've seen that, uh, but it could be any loan. So in this case, this particular woman was like, I don't qualify. So she went to friends and family and they gave her a loan. Sure. Um, so you can do that, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be a bank. Of course. Yeah, Ab absolutely. And, you know, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's very situational. This is where the planning can be very advantageous. Like, you know, how comfortable are you that you will be able to attain the loan? How, you know, if it's something that is, I'll call it like, you know, on the edge, meaning it may, it, there may be circumstances that make it to where it's difficult to qualify a loan. You may want to introduce, there are investment property products, opportunities to be a part of a consortium of investors into other products such as ticks and DSTs that you may want to add to your list that are an option that you might like um, to the extent that you aren't sure you can close in the planning phase, you can in your identification, you can find other things that will be available and will satisfy what you like to do. It also depends how much gain you have. If you don't have, if you have hardly any gain, maybe you just decide it's not worth it. If you don't find the properties you want, and that's okay, and then you just you know pay the tax, which just is pay the tax. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you have a, t a very large amount of tax, and you know I, I I'm a CPA by background, and and you know my, one of my mentors always said, don't let don't let tax wag the dog on investment decisions. But the reality is, is there's great, stable, interesting products. And I'm sure, Kathy, you can help help folks identify who to be speaking with or where to look for those that will work in the identification process that, OK, my backup plan is, you know, X, even though I want to close on one of these handful over here that I've identified. I think that's a great strategy um, and there's things that you can do that work in a quick timeline that you can be happy with, but you don't want to do that last minute because there is diligence you're going to want to do on that, on those opportunities so that they fit what you're trying to accomplish. The liquidity profile works for you amongst, and the, you know, the, the risk profile of those investments makes sense for what you're trying to do. Yeah. Bottom line, you need a backup plan and a DST is a great thing to uh, put on the identification in case, you know, let's say you want these two properties, but you have to identify three, identify the DST. You don't have to close on it. Um, right. You just have to identify a list of properties you plan to buy. And, and if you don't buy them all, that's okay. But if you can't close on some, you've got to back up. And so that's a big issue I've seen where people didn't do the backup and they um, identified a new property that wasn't finished on time. And even though it was almost finished, it didn't have the CO, uh, right. And so, you know, certificate of occupancy and you can't do it. So right. that, that is terrifying, you know, so just make sure that you've got the backup that it, otherwise, again, it's not, it's only terrifying, terrifying to the point that you're just going to have to write the tax check. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and in the end, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but yeah. there's such an opportunity. I mean, the amount, the amount of money and we, and we, we show this on our website, if, if folks want to go there, how compounding adds up. Uh, meaning if you have investment properties, you hold them for a period of time, you sell them, you pay tax, you know, and then a la stocks, buy more, buy different properties, do it. And then versus deferring all the tax, it's astounding how much that adds up through time. And, you know, when you get two decades in, you will own so much more property that the yield that you're achieving out of that does make it extremely worth it if you have a very low basis, i.e. you're, you have a lot of gains on property that you're selling. So it's just worth, it's, it's worth it, you know, it's sort of the short of it. 
So your company will be uh, representing you at our upcoming live event on May 4th in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can check that out at realwealthshow.com. We have six different property teams coming and experts like you guys to um, help people on their journey to create more passive income. And more passive income often can come through the process of 1031 exchanges taking that equity and reworking it without paying capital gain. Love it. Love it. Wow. I I appreciate the time, Kathy. And, uh, you know, we we look forward to to answering questions and meeting any of the folks who want to find out more or learn more. And, and, um, you know, we sort of pride ourselves on being an education, consultative sort of client first organization. It's the whole premise of 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 starting this firm was to do that. So, you know, we welcome anybody who wants to learn more and is considering uh, this opportunity or option and, and how we can help them. So we appreciate um, you inviting us on. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. And thank you all as well. I hope to see you at our upcoming live event. Again, that's May 4th in South San Francisco at the Convention Center. Uh, it's going to be just packed full as our events always are with lots and lots of education and information and options for you poor San Francisco Bay Area folks who can't don't even know what cash flow means because it doesn't exist. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.